Hi everyone, I'm Giselle Fernandez for Los Angeles Magazine, and this is Big Shots. This is a series where we track down the big shots, titans of industry, movers and shakers who pass through Los Angeles every day and we don't know about it till now. We track them down, we want to find out what brings them to our fine city, what business trends are happening in their various industries so we learn a little something when they're here. We want to find out what they love best about Los Angeles. We want to know when they're coming back. Hi everyone. Today's big shot is the incomparable Deborah Borda, the head of the Los Angeles Philharmonic here at Disney Hall. She presides over one of the few symphony orchestras in the nation that is thriving, not hemorrhaging money, audiences, or relevance. How does she do it? Maverick modernization. She knows how to contemporize the classics to make them cool. And as such, we see a lot of diversity on stage, but also in her new audiences and new funding sources she attracts. We catch up with Deborah as the symphony orchestra is about to turn 95 years old, this beautiful Disney hall is about to turn 10, and Gustavo Dudamel is about to celebrate his fifth season. We talk about all these milestones with Miss Borda and also her philosophy that music is a fundamental right. Meet Deborah Borda. You're a powerhouse, probably the most powerful woman in Los Angeles. <laughs> Well, I certainly wouldn't think of myself that way. <laughs> so, <laughs> sort of fascinating to hear that. Are you kidding me? Like with an iron fist, she protects <laughs> Dudamel, she protects the Disney Hall. Mm. You have a commanding um, role here and you've made such a difference in this city with your mandate and your, and your vision. Um, when you look at all the milestones, what stands out most of all amidst all these milestones? I am very proud of Yola. Youth Orchestra LA. People may know the story of how I stalked Gustavo Dudamel you know, around the world. I wish he could tell you the story because as he relates it. He's, I'm following him all over Europe, all over the world. And, and he says, well, uh, he said, Deborah, I, I thought maybe you had a crush on me. <laughs> <laughs> I did in a certain way. <laughs> He's great. He's great. Oh, you know, um, I'm glad we started with that story because it really is emblematic of everything that um, I think is your signature. You know, Gustavo, the rock and roll, young guy who, you know, contemporizes the classics without, you know, betraying them, but yeah. takes them to another level um, of the now. And everything you've done is to somehow democratize access to the arts and make it cool while not betraying the masters. Mm. Has this always been part of your vision and mission and mandate? You know, Frank Geary said something very interesting to me when we were planning to open the hall. He said, Deborah, you should make Walt Disney Concert Hall a living room for the city. And I thought that really summed up what we needed to think about. I don't know if I would have used the word democratize for myself. I think it's more about access. And I think it's more about the transaction between a community and its institutions and its musical institution. For example, when we opened Walt Disney Concert Hall, we had run a festival called Phil, the house, Phil, P-H-I-L, and we had invited 18,000 people into Walt Disney Concert Hall for free. The people who built the hall were invited in, school teachers from LA, our volunteers, uh, senior citizens, kids. 18,000 people had come in here and that touched me so much. And I guess it, maybe that is democratizing the hall, but it was a way of saying, we invite you in. So when you have said, you know, a, an, an arts organization must be relevant and must be a vibrant um, part in connection to its community, what exactly do you mean by that? That saying, music is a fundamental human right. That is Gustavo Dudamel. That is his philosophy. That is what he believes. That is what he lives. And that's what he taught me. And I think one of the most important things for all of us is that we keep on learning and changing. And it's just been such a privilege for me to work with him. But what do you mean by that exactly? That, that everyone should have access and even these, what used to be considered elitist or old institutions yeah. that were only available yeah. and accessible to the rich should be accessible yeah. to all? Well, first of all, I, it's interesting that you use the word elite in a pejorative sense. I think that's a mistake. Because to me, elite means excellent and good, and why isn't that available to everybody? I think what we're talking about is a very interesting question, and that is, where do we come to the intersection of the artistic imperative and the social imperative? Where do we find that 
middle ground? Because that's, I think, what you're talking about. How do we have that emotional and spiritual connection with the community? And once we establish that, an institution can thrive. When we inaugurated Gustavo as our new music director, we had iTunes, we had streaming, we had banners around town. That inauguration of Gustavo Dudamel was attacked as being about glitz, about Hollywood. Of course, that's the most horrible thing anybody can say in classical music. Um, and that, uh, you know, Dudamel and Borda were all about, you know, PR. It wasn't that at all. I think as leader of an institution, you have to do what you think is right. I mean, we have the most remarkable music director, you know, the rock star of music directors. Now that's a bad thing to say in the classical music world, the rock star of music directors, but he is. But he's a great, great musician. When an institution or, or a team or a school does something really well, that is a lesson and an inspiration to the rest of the city. What has most surprised you? What has been your biggest wow? How much I love Los Angeles. Um, is LA far superior to other places you've worked? Here's what's different in Los Angeles. It's an atmosphere of creativity. Uh, you know, I ran the New York Philharmonic for close to a decade. I've been here almost 13 years now, but this has been such a rewarding professional experience. If you look at our programs, we do more contemporary, sort of interesting, different kind of work than any orchestra in the country, and the audience loves it. They're younger, um, and they're more diverse. In terms of like traffic and transportation, you know, how does that affect oh. what you do? You know, I, if I have to say, what is our single greatest problem at the moment? It has to do with lack of public transportation, which has its own social message as well, um, but the traffic. Um, and when we lose subscribers or ticket buyers, we do a lot, we invest a lot in market research here because it's very important to understand. You know, orchestras are simply a microcosm of society. So what does the orchestra say about our economy and our, the state of our city today? I think it's improving. You know, I think unemployment in California is still higher than the rest of the nation. Mm -hmm. and serious. Um, some of the highest poverty rates. And some state. of the worst educational systems mm -hmm. S alongside great educational institutions and great artistic institutions. So it's how we, how we take these assets and find a way to spread them more equally because that will make society in the end healthier. I think great dichotomies are not healthy for any of us. Mm -hmm. So how does that um, conscious um, understanding and concern for the inequities of, and disparities between the rich and the not so rich enter into your then wider world? How it enters into our world at the Los Angeles Philharmonic is to have made a major investment in YOLA and in education. Um, and that is a critical step for the future. The other major investment is when you go to the Hollywood Bowl, if you want to go tomorrow night and spend one dollar for your ticket and take a bus and bring your own sandwich, cheese sandwich, you can do that. There are not many women doing what you do in this arena. Is that challenging or has it been, um, it, has it been grace, you know? <laughs> uh, it was challenging. When I first started out, uh, you know, I was the only woman CEO. You know, I never thought about my leadership in terms of gender. Um, it was my leadership. It was the work I was trying to accomplish. It was trying to make a difference. You know, the very famous uh, psychologist, Edward Schein, calls it the practice of humble inquiry. And I think women are particularly gifted at that, even so-called strong women. <laughs> This city is so lucky to have you. Yeah. We're so lucky to have your vision and your mandate. Deborah Borda, you're just magnificent. Thank you so much. Giselle, thank you yeah, very much. Pleasure. Great questions. Thank you, thank you. Deborah Borda, I think the most powerful woman leader in Los Angeles, making a real difference, changing the way our city sees itself in itself. I'm Giselle Fernandez for LA Magazine, and this is Big Shots. See you next time.